and show, perhaps just a little bit more about my background and 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 in Cambridge specifically, I'm I'm not working at the University of Cambridge. I, I was a visiting uh, lecturer about innovation in the program I studied in. So I can talk a little bit about the program, but I am working in two different conservation organizations these days, aside from nature perspectives um, that I can uh, elaborate on. One, one I, th I think you referred to this one is, is uh, unorthodox, where mm -hmm. they're based in, in Cambridge as well. And um, ah, right. Yeah, and and there we. <laughs> There we examine uh, emerging technologies and how can we use them for conservation. And more specifically, nowadays I'm working on a new project which is very out of the box, which is uh, scanning sci-fi uh, pieces to imagine desirable futures for conservation and then backcast how can we get to these futures. So that's also an interesting theme, I think very out of the box yeah what sorry i'm not sure i understand what you mean by scanning sci-fi literature yeah so think of yeah uh it, it's it's called sci-fi ai and futures for nature and what we do right. is we build these ai models to which we feed the environmental sci-fi pieces now the the beauty of sci-fi is that um it's free imagination method. It's not. It, it has some links to the current reality, but it's not uh, objectively uh, predicting things. So it's not about what is sure. probable. Probable. It's what. Uh, it's about what is possible. And mm -hmm. then we identify the innovations, the specific innovations within the sci-fi piece, and we say, guys, if we want to get to this possible future, here's a list of innovations. Here's a list of weak signals that these innovations are possible. So kind of like taking this uh, possible future and connecting it to the present. Um, and I'm excited about it because uh, perhaps it will inspire uh, young innovators in conservation to, to, you know, to do the impossible. That's, I find that really interesting because y you've heard of Cli-Fi? Yeah, yeah. Right, so I've started to see or learn about climate fiction, uh, climate science fiction, right? Yeah, and it's like a growing category of um, authors writing about a climate future. And I've I reached out to one author who just recently uh, launched his, is launching his book uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I believe his name is Steve Willis. And he's, he's, his book is called um, Fairhaven, and it's, it's, it has really good reviews. I haven't managed to read the book yet. I haven't managed to get it. But it's, it's interesting because he's also a practitioner on the background. So he has his own uh, NGO and organization uh, yeah. where he works to um, capture carbon and, and, uh, and develop technology to, to help climate. And so his he partnered with with a, a lady and i forget her name right now but uh she provided the narrative element and he provided the science right the 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 cli-fi hmm. and I, I think that's really interesting and I, i'm really interested to talk to people like that because for for a start you know i i think the uh, the desire to want to tell stories about where we're going is really interesting you know where does that come hmm. from and why do we feel the need to do that? And why do we feel it will be useful? Because I believe it, it is. I believe it will be useful. Um, yeah. Why? It, it, it's, it's I, I think cool. it's... Uh, these are people... First of all, we, we tend to perceive sci-fi authors as authors. But really what they are is activists. They right. tell you yeah, a sure. story with an agenda. Uh, with, 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 you know, the, the, the agenda to affect the present to shape the future, whether it's to avoid undesirable futures or or to lead us to a desirable future. Uh, and and they're not constrained by uh, pre assumptions of our societies. You know, it's it's a very imaginative and creative process. So it's so interesting to to talk to these people and uh, and to read 
and to and to learn about their methods as well because they really they really change minds yeah no exactly and and on that i think um there had from from the little bit of research i've been doing there has been traditionally a um a spirit of catastrophization in cli-fi right the world is uh, it's apocalypse the world's going to the end but increasingly there's the the cli-fi that's coming out is more optimistic more positive more um you know practical and so i think you know again it's it's really interesting that we're we're even changing the stories that we tell like the system is changing the stories that 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 it tells to the people like we know we have to do that or something like that it's really i think it's quite yeah um, go, going from a from a blame game and from a dystopian futures into a, a constructive futures something we can do something about something we can aspire to it gives hope you know yeah um yeah it's fascinating it, uh, yeah it is and, and i think that 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 the power of story like that what we're doing as a society right that idea that we feel the need to tell these stories is such an ancient thing right it's comes from way 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 back right and i think the power of story is um to to inflict to uh to influence change is really huge you know um i was just listening this morning to charles eisenstein i i think that's his name and he was t- he talks a lot about the old story that kind of forms how we live traditionally and now we're moving into a new story right and we need to make the transition from one story of being to the new story the story being the like operating system of how how we work in the world i think that's really fascinating yeah. how we perceive so when, the world yeah what? yeah and so when we we're talking about ideas of like paradigm shifting things a lot of what i'll talk about um is how can we leverage story to change the the, the paradigm i think uh we'll get to it when we talk about paradigm level change but storytelling is is the really the the only tool i can think of nevertheless the best tool i can think of to change how we perceive the world to change our paradigms so yeah storytelling um it's uh <laughs> almost mystical how how it affects the the way we go about in in life you know um yeah yeah it's fascinating um and and also as part of this sci-fi ai and futures for nature work that i'm leading um one part of it is to well the the bottom line is what can we learn from sci-fi that is useful for conservation today and one big chunk of it is okay what innovations are depicted in these stories and and not just technological but also social innovations what paradigms shall we change and so on uh, which is very interesting but also another whole layer of it is how is the story told? What can we learn from sci-fi about how to tell good stories? Should it be in first person? Should it be in third person? Should it like what are the rhetoric tools that sci-fi authors use to get people imagine futures? You know, uh, so so it's a very multi-layered project. Uh, very interesting. I'm learning a lot of new stuff. I, I wasn't a sci-fi geek before. Uh, I, I still cannot. Uh, like testify on myself that I am, but but I'm learning a lot about it as a, as a useful tool, a valuable tool. Have you heard of, um, well, firstly, I think it's interesting you're looking at it from the perspective of how to tell good stories, because I never thought of, of that element of it. But that does also remind me of the, have you heard of the author Tyson Juncker Porter? No. He, okay, so he, he's an Australian um, uh, academic in the, I don't know the exact words, but it's something like the science of complexity. He's also a, an, um, an Aboriginal um, from far north, um, or he's, he's, he's half Aboriginal, I'm not sure exactly. 
Um, but he wrote a book called Sand Talk, which um, he talks about how he believes the, the way that the Aborigines in Australia um, thought about stories and communicated stories and intelligence will be the solution for the world, right? In terms of it's, it's a way of, of dealing with complex systems and, and in, by using right. metaphor, right? And interacting with complex systems. So he's matching, he's bringing together these two uh, types of science and, and, and indigenous science and then, you know, complex systems science together. And it's very interesting. In his latest book, he just released it and I'm trying to get a copy. Oh, actually I ordered one is um, called Right Story and Wrong Story. And right. what he's talking about is there are right kinds of stories, but there are also wrong kind of stories. And wrong kind of stories, I only got a, a, you know, a very high level idea of what he was talking about, but I think it's something like <clears throat> wrong stories are like stories that are, are ideologically powered or corrupted or something like that whereas right stories are about sort of authenticity and and openness or something like that very um i i think that's uh yeah i, I find his work really fascinating can you can you share a little more about sen talk and specifically the type of philosophy or uh, uh methods that he, he talks about from indigenous wisdom Sure. Um, so I'm not an expert, right? So, so, but I can give you some, some uh, sort of things that I took away. He, he talks about um, all throughout the, the book, he, he does little uh, drawings in the sand. And he, he explains how these drawings um, have really deep, significant meaning. They're, they're also tools for, for, um, for transferring knowledge down through, the, through time. Um, and, but they also, you know, a little bit like our, our stories, our fairy tales and things like that, they have really profound meaning the, the, the deeper you, you dive in, you know, a little bit like sort of the yin and yang kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one example, and I'm not going to get this right, but I'll, I'll try to give you kind of the spirit of what he was talking about is he talks about the Aboriginal flag, which I'm not sure if you know what it is, but it's. It's like uh, two rectangles, right? Um, red and black. I believe that's correct. And then in the middle, there's a circle that kind of looks like the sun, right? Mm. You know what? I need to just Google the Aboriginal flag first. Let's see. I don't need to. Uh... Yeah, so it's, it's red on the bottom, black on the top with like a yellow sun in the middle, right? And so what he talks about, it's something like what that means is it's about going from the earth to the sky, right? From order to chaos, right? And, and you need to make a transition between these two to, to create anything. And in the middle is what they refer to as dream time, where you go into dream time to, to bring together chaos and order to, to create new things, something like that. Beautiful. And and having that in balance, like like having the earth and the sky in balance, and dream time in the middle is really critical. He he explained that if you were to draw that diagram for the West, it would be, you know, a very slim, slim, uh, bit of earth, and a way really big sky because we're very abstract, and then instead of a circle, we would have like a triangle. Like it's got direction. We're mm. always going that way kind of thing. Towards the chaos. Something like that, right? And, and he, he talks about this in these diagrams, which, you know, a lot of people believe are really simple, ancient, you know, doodles. There's all this wisdom. And Sand Talk is about he, he draws these diagrams and, and he, he tells the story of, of some, he shares some of the wisdom from these stories. It's really, it's fascinating. I love that kind of stuff. It's, it's beautiful. I, I suspect I found myself lately a lot within the uh, dream time zone of, of trying to create, trying to bring down things from chaos to the ground. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> cool. So, so right. in 2017, 2018, I, I co-founded a biotech company. 
called uh, Wild Biotech. Mm -hmm. And it took me around the world. We sampled the microbiomes of wild animals uh, and, and really built the, the first of its kind database of microbiomes and genetics of the microbiomes of wild animals. Uh, fascinating work, really entrepreneurial. It taught me a lot. Um, it, it, uh, it led to me being in nature a lot and, and, you know, spending times with animals more, more than, uh, other beings. Um, and then COVID came and, um, I realized that although it's kind of a, a parallel universe to conservation, and I do find myself a lot in nature and doing great, great science, I really want to dedicate myself fully all the tools that I've acquired, all, all my time to conservation work. And then um, I left the company, uh, left my position as a co-founder, and I found myself in, in Cambridge in, in the master's program for conservation leadership, okay. which uh, it's important for me to, to mention that because I think it's such a wonderful program. And I think whoever listens to the podcast uh, and they feel like perhaps they're, they're, they're stuck, perhaps they don't know how to get to the practicalities of conservation. That's such a good program. Uh, it gathers conservation leaders or aspired leaders from around the world uh, in a tiny room for a whole year, speaking about conservation innovation, conservation governance, um, and how can we actually lead change for conservation. So. Wow, that sounds fascinating. It's such a great program. It's called the Enfield in Conservation Leadership. Um, and there I really got into paradigms and, and researching paradigms because, well, first of all, let's start with what are paradigms. So paradigms, mm -hmm. we, yeah. we were talking about stories earlier, but paradigms are the ways we see the world, our very fundamental set of beliefs that are mostly implicit. We don't know they're there. They're always there at the bottom of everything we do. And they're acquired from our families, from our friends, environment, from our work culture. So if we talk about societal paradigms, arguably one of the most prevailing paradigms these days is growth, right? And capitalism in our economic systems. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, going towards the chaos. Um, and if we look at smaller systems, let's say the conservation sector, so we, we have a, a very uh, specific set of beliefs which directs everything we do and the ways we do conservation. And we hardly question it. We, we hardly look into these deep-seated paradigms and think, mm. do they serve our purpose well? Um, and I think, well, I would love to share my screen for a sec to, to demonstrate a uh, great, great work by Donella Meadows. She, she influenced me a lot. Uh, so when I started to think about paradigms and how can it be useful for conservation, I came across the amazing, the, the very inspiring work by Donella Meadows. She was a, a system scientist and an environmentalist, mm -hmm. really, and an activist, one of the first people to, to talk about the, the the fact that uh, eternal growth is unsustainable. Uh, widely acclaimed scientist, and I think uh, underappreciated in our field. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I would recommend reading her, her work. And Danena Meadows, she, she worked with governments, she worked with corporations, she worked with very complex uh, socio-economical systems, psychological systems, uh, very complex systems. And from her work with the, within these organizations, she thought, perhaps I can map what's the best way to transform a system, a complex system. Uh, and she came up with, the, with this concept of 12 leverage points to intervene in a system. And she mapped, basically, mm -hmm. if, we, if we look at the system as, as our society, or mm -hmm. we look at it as the conservation sector, there are, there are a set or a types of interventions, of efforts that we can do to truly transform a system. And these are leverage points. If you, if you intervene in these points, the whole system kind of tilts 
uh, or completely transforms. And, and she prioritized it by, by the amount of leverage that you get. And, and you can see, I, I won't get into oh, all, of, right, all of it right now, but she's saying that most interventions that she came across uh, after decades of working with organizations and with environmentalists as well, um, most people, because it's easier to design for lower leverage points, most people are doing their conservation works around these, these lines, constant and parameters and numbers, let's say, uh, we want to take the uh, snow leopard from 100 individuals to 4,000. So if we put all our effort there, would it actually transform the system? Uh, of course, it's, it's a great effort. Of course, it's very appreciated. But does it have the power to change how people think of nature? Does it have the power to change our, our the goals of the system for eternal growth and so on? So, so again, that's one example. Another example, let's go up the ladder of, of leverage point. Uh, you can mm -hmm. see negative feedback loops. If let's say carbon credits, if people uh, emit, let's create a negative feedback loop that they would have to pay for every uh, ton of carbon that they emit. That's a negative yep, feedback sure. loop within the system. Let's climb a little up the, the ladder and we, we see information flows over here. So mm -hmm. let's say you go to the supermarket and you buy a, a tuna can, which says um, this is a fair trade, or we make information more accessible to the public. That's information flows. It's surprisingly, it has a, a big leverage on systems. It, it has the potential to change everything. Um, but the highest of all leverage points is to change the mindset and the paradigms, the way people think about the world, the, the way, uh, well, their set of beliefs about the world. Because if we change our True. set of beliefs, it dictates everything down the line. It will dictate what our goal is. It will dictate our set of rules within our systems and so on. So it's a very interesting uh, work that I think conservationists should be aware of. Uh, it, it, for me, it gives me a framework to assess where do I put my efforts where I decided to dedicate my whole life to conservation, where should I put my weight, you know? Um, and, and as you go up the ladder, it's harder to design interventions or, or efforts, um, mm -hmm. but it has much more leverage. So this is kind of the, the uh, general framework from which I started my, uh, my research at Cambridge at the Amphilian Conservation Leadership. And and I was asking myself, okay, if paradigms are the, the highest leverage points, what paradigms can we change in the way we do conservation and the way we as conservation practitioners look at the conservation uh, work that we do? Because first of all, there's been a phenomenal, like phenomenal people in conservation, phenomenal efforts are, uh, all, all along. Uh, the existence of this field, but arguably, when you look at biodiversity loss, it's not so encouraging. So, so we're we're having great people, we're we're making great efforts, uh, but biodiversity declines. So I thought of how can we turn the the spotlights to to us, to the ways we think of conservations, to the way we do conservation, uh, mm -hmm. to to truly transform the conservation system to become more effective. And the first, the first uh, issue that I, I thought of was, well, well, first of all, I framed my, my uh, thesis around rethinking conservation paradigms. Um, and the first, the first issue that I thought of what was, okay, what paradigms can I think of in conservation? This, this set of beliefs right. that we go about as default and we hardly question. Um, and one of the first thing which came to, which came to my mind was uh, uh, conservation is a non-profit field. You know, it's, it's kind of very ingrained uh, within the ways we do conservation. Why is it uh, ingrained in, in, to, to that extent? Uh, so I was asking the, the why question, which is, the first step in, in changing a paradigm is asking, wait, why do we actually do it? 
Um, and then I came across this research over here. One of the first thing I, uh, I came across during the research was how the public perceives nonprofits versus for profits or for purpose or the private sector or however we want to frame it, you know, mm -hmm. um, because we're very much ingrained with how we think about uh, uh, nonprofits versus for profit. But th th this is called, yeah, it's it's true. And, and this is called. It's hilarious. Yeah. This is it's called, funny. The government is down in the bottom left corner. Uh, there, there you go, uh, and far, far away down, right? Uh, it's uh, it's called the trust barometer um, by by uh, this uh, this firm, which is called Edelman, and you can see that well, businesses are perceived by the, the general public as uh, highly competent but non-ethical. You can see that NGOs are perceived as very ethical, but non-competent. Mm -hmm. And that raises a very uh, basic question of going back to what I said about biodiversity loss. Do, do we want to be competent or do we want to be ethical or do we want to be both, right? That, that, that's like, where do we want to see conservation, the conservation sector uh, on this barometer? Um, and you can see no institution is seen as both competent and ethical. How mm -hmm. can we move conservations or the ways we do conservation so that we are both ethical? Uh, uh, it's something that, that we cannot run from, uh, actually. Like we, we're at the very base of, of us being conservationist. Ethics uh, is a big part of what we do. But uh, how do we move towards being more competent as well? And I asked myself, um, well, I asked people, I, I conducted a survey. Uh, you can see my screen now, right? Yeah. You, you cannot, sorry. Oh, no, sorry, I cannot, no. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, the first thing I, I, I went to, to examine was, is there a paradigm in place? Like, do we actually do conservation? When I'm as a, as a new uh, conservation, uh, uh, innovator, when I form an initiative, would I automatically and by default go towards the nonprofit model? And then why? So I, I surveyed uh, uh, quite a big group of conservationists and a very diverse group of conservationists. And over 60% of them said um, that when they open a new organization for conservation, it would be a for profit, no question about it. So it was very definitive. Um, it would be a for-profit. No it, it would be a non-profit, sorry. Right, okay. It would be a non-profit. Yeah, so right. 60% uh, and a little more were, were saying that uh, we will open a new conservation initiative. We will, by default, make it a, a, a non-profit. And then I wanted to, to know why, you know. Why? Why do people think, think about it? Uh, this way, and and by the way, uh, female respondents were more prone to to say we will open a for-profit conservation organization. So so th there were a, a lot of interesting, That's interesting, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting findings. The the amount, the sample uh, size of the sample that I took wasn't large enough to to generalize on the conservation sector as a whole. That's for sure. Um, but still, some some of these anecdotes. I found very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And another thing that I've seen was, and that's a, a very interesting one. If you look at uh, older ages of conservation practitioners, the, the younger you get, the more prone you are to uh, open a for-profit initiative. So you can really start to see that there is a change of how we think about conservation, what is right, what is more effective and so on. Um, the younger you, you, you get, you're more prone to open a for-profit conservation initiative. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. So, so do you have, did you, were you able to dig into why you got some of these results? <clears throat> yeah. And I, so I don't want to take you off your flow. So, you know, I don't want to interrupt too much. 
No, I'm very happy for you to, to ask questions. I can, I can, you know, I can adjust. Um, okay. So, why do they go nonprofit? What What are the reasons? Let's Let's get to that. The out of ten types of reasons for people to go nonprofit, there there are two that are the most prominent. One was the fear of skewed priorities. If I'm becoming a for-profit, I uh, by default, my priorities would uh, tend towards profit, and hence, I wouldn't do my conservation work. Now, that, that's a perception. Is it right or sure. not? We'll, we'll get to that. But the second thing was concerns about uh, over how we are seen, both by the public and both by our peers. So uh, I yeah, think... Sure. 80% of the conservationists who responded to the survey said um, that if I'm opening a for-profit, that would be looked upon by my peers. So we start to see this. Uh, I didn't say it about paradigms, but there are uh, these self-reinforcing loops of why are they in place? Why is it so hard to break out of them? And one of, one of it is the social aspect of, of uh, expectations from our environment and so on. So people are very concerned about how are they seen. Um, and when I came to, to, to talk with the conservation innovators who opened for profit or for purpose, I, I'd rather say uh, for purpose initiatives, um, they, they didn't face the, the conflict of, of priorities between their profit and their uh, the profit making and their conservation uh, objectives because they aligned it. They made sure that right. their model, when it when profit goes in, uh, that means that their conservation results are there. So so you see that people have this perception about for profits. They never try to 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 lead a for profit uh, initiative, but uh, these perceptions are not necessarily right. Um, we can also question like whether the fact that we uh, provide services or take money from, from people for these services as, as for-profits um, entails that they would see us in a different light. Perhaps they would see us as more uh, competent. Perhaps they, they, they would still see the alignment between uh, our services and, and the, you know, the benefit for nature conservation. So, so it's all about perceptions, really. Um, and, and then I, I examined, okay, let's say this paradigm is in place. How does it affect the, what I call the three P's? It, it's, uh, conservation purpose, conservation processes and conservation people last but not least. And, and you can see that, uh, from the responses of conservationists, they say in terms of conservation purpose. Well, when we are uh, relying on donations, on big donations from donors, we actually skew our priorities. So we actually uh, adapt the, the conservation efforts that we conduct to fit the, the agenda of, of the donor. And that's not necessarily what we think should be done or what we want to do. Uh, but you see how the whole system kind of adjusts because uh, this is the source of funding that we rely on. So we see unintended consequences for our conservation purpose. And sure. Uh, Could I just give a, a practical example of, of yeah, that? Sure. I've, I've seen it so much with particularly small NGOs. I know it exists at, at the larger NGO level as well, but so many small NGOs, they're getting their funding in uh, tied to projects. And it's, it's the quickest, easiest way to, to get their funding. And they're always chasing these projects. And as a result, they will take projects that not don't necessarily align with the needs of the people on the ground that they're trying to help because they need the money, right? And so they will literally change what they're doing to try to fit it into that project box. And they do that over and over again. And the, the, the knock-on effect of that is when they started they had a very clear uh strategy and idea of what they wanted to do but the more they get 
pulled away in different directions, the, the more they get, their strategy gets, gets um, diluted and they, they become almost, um, um, almost directionless and they're just chasing little bits and, and very short term. And it's, it's very, very hard funding environment for small NGOs to produce anything of benefit long term because of things like that, right? De definitely, yeah, and and you see it uh, all across. And uh, I think it goes back to the the this alignment issue. How do we align our funding sources and what we rely on to give us a, a air to breathe as a, as an initiative to what we actually want and think should be done? You know, um, and and you see it uh, over and over again with. Uh, reliance on donations and, and of course again we're generalizing here and um, i'm sure we've seen these initiatives and and others as well but what i'm saying is should we go for non-profit as a default i'm not I, i'm not saying that we shouldn't become non-profits in conservation i'm saying we should diversify the ways we do conservation and i'm saying uh we should really carefully think of what model we go for there are unintended consequences to, to both. Um, so uh, and, uh, another thing for in the under the theme of conservation purpose was that uh, people testify that when they go nonprofit, they compromise their long term sustainability. So a, as you said, we, we go by the project because we rely on grants or donations and uh, we constantly have to chase the, this funding. Right. Um, instead of providing a service or a product or something which is aligned with the conservation purpose that we do, which we can take o over the long run. Uh, so people in conservation would choose the nonprofit model, although they, uh, they claim it compromises the long-term sustainability of their efforts. Um, and then we went down the, the conservation processes uh, uh, Mm -hmm. lens and and we've seen that it uh people testify that it uh compromises risk taking the fact that they rely on donations mm -hmm. so uh donors are less uh prone to take risks or to allow risk taking and that in turn compromises innovation and exploration and creativity uh so we see that it also uh, aside from actually harming the way we get to our purpose, it, it also harms, arguably harms the, the processes and how we innovate and risk taking conservation. And last but not least, conservation people. So we're doing a, a work which should be uh, highly appreciated. We should highly appreciate what we do. We dedicate our lives to it. And what you see is that people testify that they're basically overworked and underpaid. Um, almost 80% of people, of respondents, said that when they chose to go for the conservation sector, to dedicate their life to conservation, they knew they compromised their well-being, their, their personal well-being. Uh, sh should it be this way? Uh, and and is, is that also... Uh, kind of a side effect or a symptom of us relying on donations and, and going the, the nonprofit route. Um, so that's something I really dug into as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've seen a lot of that, you know, and part of my reason for wanting to do this podcast is because I saw so many people get really quickly disillusioned. You know, there's so many talented people that want to do stuff, want to get involved, but they're like, oh, but look at nonprofits. They make no money. I can't. You know, how am I gonna, how would I survive and things like that? And so this is about trying to sh paint a picture, <clears throat> excuse me, of the fact that, no, it's possible to do do things in conservation, which are um, which are exciting and dynamic and 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 also uh, rewarding um, uh, financially. And I think that's really yeah. important. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I, lately I'm getting a lot of calls from friends who want highly talented people who want to to work in conservation and they ask where are these opportunities you know who, who provides them how, how can we find it 
and it's hard in our sector to find that there are organizations who, who uh, yeah, prioritize the well-being of their people, but it, uh, we're, we're, we're mostly about the cause. And I think we overlook the fact that our well-being as conservationists is part of the cause. <laughs> it, right. It, we cannot get to the right uh, results without uh, w- with us being uh, burnt out. Basically. Yeah, there's there's one thing you said. I, I don't know if this is important, but it it just let me say it and see. Um, you said that, and maybe we should be paying them more, right? And and so I don't know if it's a, a matter of should, right? That that kind of I don't know how that where that the should comes from. Uh, but what I would say, uh, another way to say it is if we want. To attract, you know, talented people who are who are energized and dynamic and going for it, then they need to be. There needs to be a way that those people can make um, a good living and a life out of it. And until we we address that as a as a sector, those kind of people won't come. Right? You'll only get the ones who are, you know, like self-flagellating and they'll just come and and not get paid, and and, you know, exactly. they're, they're almost like missionaries. Yeah, and and it's we we can dig much deeper into that because it also comes from a from a paradigm from a way we think about um, making a living as conservationists. So again, I'm generalizing, but a lot of the respondents mm. said that if I am doing well in terms of of my living, my salary, and so on, I would be looked upon by my peers. And if you look at other sectors. Um, arguably people people who do good and do well in, in terms of their well-being uh, are celebrated and and that's again right. something that we should think of in terms of our culture and our set of beliefs do, do we apply a peer pressure on people who are doing uh, good and doing well or or do we celebrate it or something in between you know so um, it goes back to, to the culture in, in, cons- in the conservation sector. Uh, and, and you see where it comes from. I mean, there, there are good reasons because we, we perceive, and again, it comes from the results of the survey, we perceive that uh, doing well or, or making a profit necessarily comes uh, or, or uh, tops the, the purpose. It, it, it compromises the, the cost. Mm-hmm. Should it be this way, or we can align doing well and doing good? So um, it, it's all it's it's how we perceive it, and we we rely on a very small pie of grants and and, and um, donations, which which makes it a reality. Yeah, if if we pay more to people, it comes on, on top of the cause. Um, so it goes back again to how can we diversify our funding sources and the ways we do conservation to solve this problem as well. Yes, agreed. I don't think that solves the whole problem, though. Um, and I, I had a discussion recently with uh, Dr. Azim Prakash from the University of Washington, uh, who's the author of, of a piece about why NGOs fail. And he coined the phrase, um, the virtue narrative. And I think that's this very, it's a very interesting lens on this whole whole discussion. Uh, so I want to get into that. It'll take a bit of time to sort of paint the whole picture. So do you, you, you tell me if, if you want me to do that now or should, I, should we keep going and then I'll come back to that? I would love that. I would love to learn more. Yeah. Okay. So he talks about so he, he's, he's a, a, a professor of political science, and he talks about um, uh, organizational structures. Right? And he, in, in our discussion, he, he talked about there's, you've got the, um, there's three key organizational structures in our society. There's um, government, right? There's the market, um, businesses. And then we've evolved this third one, which is like community um community structures and so that's the the third one is the the ngo sector and he talks about um 
the the first one government there is a a mechanism of creative destruction meaning that there's a feedback loop which ensures that government is changed and refreshed generally speaking right there should be to have government change and that's voting and things like that um in the market the the process of feedback and um creative destruction is built into the model right you've got the the way the money's funded but it's also the fact that the customers buy buy the product right buy yeah, the if you don't give them. value you're you're out of the game exactly so creative destruction is very the, the loops very very fast but the the problem in the community sector is the ngo the non-profit sector is that we don't have this creative destruction and so if we don't have this creative destruction then um you know things don't change things don't move things don't evolve it's like a closed system closed systems in nature are you know are are are, are systems that fester and 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 they don't renew and regenerate and so um and he he explains that and a part of how we've maintained that is we've created this idea of the virtue narrative right where we're there we're doing good so we don't need to be judged and analyzed and that kind of thing something like that i'm i'm you know i'm not doing a great job of explaining but this something in that so i proposed to him i said yeah well what if you change the funding structures so that it's not project based what if you change the funding so it's um results it's based. Uh, results based or or like uh what i've seen with uh, there's an organization called the mulaga foundation they do unrestricted funding So they they look at what you're doing, how you measure your impact, and if you're a good organization and you're doing good stuff, they will fund you large amounts for multi years, right? So you're now more similar to like VC funding, right? So you're yeah. now comfortable, you've got space, you don't have to worry about, you know, where you're going to get your money from next week. You can now focus on your problem, you can focus on your on your the community you're working with the environment you're working with and build long term um solutions so organizations like blue ventures i uh, got funded by malago um malia silly um i didn't uh, I talk with them they got funded by malago so if you change that it can change the thing and azim's response was yes look that would help but there's still one piece which is missing which is the community at who's being served in in the private sector we call those the customers and the customers are the ones who vote with their money the community has no has no vote in these models still so the so the creative destruction isn't isn't doesn't get the feedback from the community so how can and and so he his question he posed the question if we could come up with a model that is unrestricted funding and also builds in the community feedback where the community is is buying or taking uh voting for or engaging with the 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 um the service or or product voluntarily then then you've got that really healthy feedback yeah and he doesn't say it but i think reading between the lines effectively what he's saying is he doesn't think the non non-profit model works yeah that's a bit hard he means it doesn't he do, it doesn't work as well as what we're looking for we need some more diversity in the model exactly i i would go with diversifying how we do conservation and and again yeah. not, none of what we say here is is to discourage non-profit efforts i think there, there are so many examples uh from history of, of great non-profit initiatives which really do create a change but should we be in a, in a in a position where 90% of conservation initiatives are non-profit uh fighting right. for this small pie and there very interesting uh, uh uh way to look at it what you just proposed and I, i wasn't aware of his work but it really closely aligned to to what i found during my research um first of all this what is your incentive to innovate change be creative uh when you're doing a conservation project it's it's limited you, you can always fall back on on the safety net of of applying to grants uh, uh and right. 
you know making new projects and but you don't have this feedback mechanism of do i actually achieve my result like uh like like in the private sector and 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 that makes the virtue narrative as you said takes me back to the first graph we we looked at uh which makes us more ethical but less competent um right. and I, I want to to share with you the the i think the result which is i found most fascinating during my work and uh really closely aligned to what you said about the the virtue um aspect of the things let's see how did you call it the virtue narrative the virtue narrative yeah yeah so if i would have to show uh, uh conservation people the conservation community one result that i find very interesting is this one this is how respondents as conservationists perceive themselves as, as uh, institutions. So I ask them questions about um, different attributes of their organizations or, or the conservation NGOs and different attributes of businesses. And what you see all across the board is that those attributes that are related to competence and effectiveness they themselves mm -hmm. attribute to businesses and all those attributes which relate to virtue and, and um, ethics are uh, attributed to uh, NGOs. So, for instance, when you ask uh, all these conservation respondents, what, what type of organization has more efficient processes, businesses or NGOs? You can see that... Um, over 60% of the respondents said uh, businesses over here on the left. So undoubtedly, they, they attribute efficiency to uh, mm -hmm. for profit. Uh, when you ask them about innovativeness, you see that conservation people say, yeah, um, businesses are far more innovative than, than NGOs. When you ask about long-term sustainability, far more uh, uh, attributed to businesses, risk-taking, um, adaptive to changing conditions. So businesses are perceived as more adaptive as well. All these things that if you're a young conservationist who want to open an organization, you would want to be efficient. You would want to be effective. You would want to be innovative. You would want it to be long-term uh, sustainable on the long-term. And and you see that we, we say that it, these are for profit or for purpose attributes, but we would still mm -hmm. go with, with the with the other model of non profit. And why? On the other side of the scale, you would see that it, it's perceived as far more ethical. Um, that's interesting. People perceive it as more fulfilling. So again, perhaps that's the virtue narrative. So uh, right. I would feel yeah. better if, if I would uh, uh, do a non profit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that and it's also ethical, right? I, I I feel like I'm being more ethical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But again, that that's a part of them. That's the way we think about these type of organizations. Can we find examples or can we create examples that are aligned between uh, making a, a, a good living or making a good sustainable organization, which is very ethical and contribute to conservation? So um we actually see more and more of these organizations popping out these days of, of young entrepreneurs uh, or ecopreneurs who uh well want to prove that this model works we can do conservation initiatives that are self-sustaining that provide services or products that that are have this creative cycle mechanisms um yeah and achieve and are much more effective in achieving conservation impact. So that's that's encouraging uh, in terms of diversifying how we do conservation. What, what do you think so far? So I'm 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 following, and and I think this is brilliant. Um, I, I think it's it's crazy that it's almost insane that you that 
the NGO people themselves recognize that the businesses, that a for-profit model is more sustainable even. Um, and it has all these qualities, yet they choose to go that way. That, that's uh, an indicator for a paradigm. Because if you right, remember, yeah. the paradigms are deeply ingrained. They're hardly questioned. So, so what I did here is actually got these respondents to question these aspects, which they usually don't don't deal with. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to me as well. That's why I, I find it the, one of the most interesting findings is conservation people themselves would testify these things, right? But they would still go by default to a nonprofit. Uh, yeah, wow. and, and and that goes to perhaps the last part of, of the findings that I would like to share is then what keeps the paradigm in place? Why do we go by default towards a, a nonprofit initiative? And the answer is a lot of things. There are so many when you look at any paradigm, basically, if a paradigm is, is the source of the system, so this is how it was built from the get go. We have all these institutional reasons and, and feedback loops that keeps it in place. So everything we build in the conservation sector is not by design, but it keeps the nonprofit paradigm in place. Um, and, and let's have a look together because it's a very intricate map, but very interesting because it, it also shows the pathways through which we can break out of this paradigm and diversify how we do conservation. So I'll go to the result over here. This is the mind map of, of the conservation sector and what keeps the nonprofit paradigm in place. And again, it's very anecdotal because there are plenty of other mechanisms as well. This is what I found sure. during my research. Um, how do I get this bigger? Okay. So if this is the nonprofit paradigm, these are all the loops, the feedback loops that keeps it in place. And these are institutional, these are uh, perceptional. So, so how we perceive it, these are like mind barriers to go out of the nonprofit paradigm. And over here at the top is diverse ways, novel ways of doing conservation. So let's just look at a couple of these loops. You can see that, um, well, Right. First of all, donors mostly fund nonprofits. And if your basic assumption is that you rely on donations, then you would have to be a nonprofit, right? So, so you, you were talking about unrestricted funding and so on. Uh, you would hardly find grants and uh, donors who are willing to donate to uh, for profits or for purpose or other types other than uh, nonprofits. So that by itself, gets people sure. into a, a this cycle um well we were talking about uh limited resource pool right we we rely mm -hmm. on donations um and there is a belief so we're going into the belief layer uh, a belief that personal profit contradicts conservation goals and then that makes us uh, see self-care or well-being as harm to the cause. And that creates peer pressure. So we're, again, we're, we're uh, pressured to, to stay within the nonprofit or the virtue narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can see uh, that donors are risk adverse. They're, then there is lack of innovation. Then there is lack of viable business models and lack of examples to showcase like if i'm a young conservationist who, who opened my new initiative what examples would i see that show me that it's possible to align my profit making or my sustainability with my conservation goals that we, we we lack these good examples because we're in this these cycles which uh makes us not innovate basically um and, and it goes much much deeper i guess we, we can find many other uh over here uh yeah. to beliefs and institutional uh stuff so, so so then the question which is which can be asked is was what can we do if we right. have all these forces keeping the, the paradigm in place how can we break out of these cycles um and there can be a lot a, a lot of interventions in our 
paradigm level in the way we perceive it perhaps we should celebrate uh, uh, these examples who are doing good and doing well perhaps we should change our own attitudes towards it um, perhaps yeah sorry sorry I, I just wanted to share something which which aligns with what, what you're saying I wanted to get it in now before just before we move forward I don't know if you've seen this this is a um, an article by um, Kevin Starr, who's the, I think he's the CEO of the Mulago Foundation. Um, have, have you seen this article? No. Okay. So he calls it, Don't Feed the Zombies, which is uh, obviously a, hmm. a provocative title. But in this, this graph here, I don't know if I maybe need to zoom in a little bit. Um, it, this this graph here shows this is what people think the distribution of impact is across all the NGOs, right? So you've got some that are not, you know not so great, um, some that are great, but the distribution between what's great and what's not great is is not huge, right? So mm -hmm. that's what lay people think it's like. But when you ask experts what they think about the sector it looks like this where hmm. there's even a whole bunch of of charities and, and ngos that are doing harm most charities are producing almost nothing and the very top charities do a hundred times more impact than than the others than the average charity so it's really distributed uh to to one to the the very small performing uh, proportion of organizations. So I feel like that that's quite interesting for several reasons. One, it, it's, it supports a lot of what you're arguing. But the other thing that's quite kind of interesting about this article is the fact that someone is, is sharing that, like Kevin Starr, the fact that he's, he's saying that, he's trying to force some creative destruction. He's trying to say, don't feed the zombies. Don't fund the, you know, to go back to your little mind map, don't be a donor that funds organizations that aren't doing good work. Let's get some creative, let's try to bring some discipline and creative destruction into the sector. So it's the beginning of people starting to talk about that kind of thing. Exactly. And, and, you, and you see it, you see it all across. You see uh, uh, new types of funding schemes uh, arise. You see new type of, of, Ecopreneurs, uh, uh, which refuse yeah. to be a part of of of, of uh, this specific paradigm, and and yeah, you, you start to see it everywhere, um, and it's I think it's very good that we we start these conversations. Um, I want to to conclude this part about about this specific research and about rethinking this conservation paradigm with. Uh, the fact that we, we can, the way we can break out of these cycles and diversify how we do conservation, it can be very non-intuitive as well. So mm -hmm. one, and again, I'm, I'm being provocative for a sec, I think, um, because we need people to be provoked to think differently. Mm -hmm. How come, speaking of conservation people, how come we don't have a conservation union? taking care of the conditions of people working in conservation. So the, we, we have huge initiatives like the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, which, which gathers uh, some of the biggest top charities uh, in conservation. And these are hundreds of people from around the world sitting together. Most testify being overworked, underpaid. And I've been talking with people in, in conservation about the, 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 the possibility to unionize. Um, mm -hmm. And those who tried before, um, well, they encountered uh, severe opposition because people, again, see their own, the perception is that uh, it would harm the cause if we would demand more. But I argue that what if we, Unionize. First of all, it's a, it's a good uh, uh, change of mindset for us. It's a good exercise to think to think a little differently. 
and also I, I believe that it will uh, it, it will force these big charities to innovate to think uh, you, you know it will create this mechanism that you were talking about this, this creative uh, destruction of, of okay we, we need to do better for our workers we need to innovate the ways we do conservation so so it, it uh, introduces some kind of um, well pressure to innovate I, I would argue uh, both in the mindset level of how we think of our mm -hmm. work and also in terms of the organizations and what they do to to maintain people in, in the in the field and um, to make sure that people are doing good and, and to attract minds from other sectors as well so so it's just anecdotal uh, anecdotal i don't think necessarily that's what should happen like a conservation union but it, it's a good mind exercise to to start to think of how we change these norms um and how we change well how we do conservation uh, to make it more effective so yeah. that that's that's one thing um and I want to conclude this part, if I may, with, with, a, with a quote by Donella Meadows. But first to say that what we just said might, be, might seem to, to some people as provocative or, or, uh, uh, or as if we depreciate the, the work of, of conservation NGOs, and that's completely not the intention. Um, but if you, if you did listen to it and you felt some kind of resistance, towards these ideas, it's because paradigms uh, uh, trying to change our very fundamental paradigms evoke resistance, like that's, that's how paradigms work. And Donella Meadows is concluding the part of changing paradigms. As a, and again, she's saying that the highest leverage point to change a system is to address the paradigm. She's saying, because mindsets and paradigms guide behavior, Changing them can have a profound impact. You could say paradigms are harder to change than anything else about a system, and therefore this item should be the lowest on the list, not second to highest. But there is nothing necessarily physical, expensive, or even slow in the process of paradigm change. In a single individual, like our conversation over here, it can happen in a millisecond. All it takes is a click in the mind, an epiphany, a new way of seeing. Whole societies or whole systems, however, are another matter. They resist challenges to their paradigms harder than they resist anything else. So it's very natural to feel a resistance when, when someone brings an idea which, which shatters uh, our, our current paradigms. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean we, we shouldn't question our, question our paradigms. So, so I hundred percent agree, and I, this has all been really fascinating. You know, I I can think of of several examples, and maybe small examples of ways in which um, paradigms have changed and can change and can change like that, right? Um, Often, like from my my perspective and from my experience, it's often it can often be related to technology and how technology is has changes the you know uh, changes the way things happen. Is that do you want to talk about that those kind of things now, or should we get into nature's perspectives and talk about our ideas of how to change the paradigm? Yeah, to... I think we can. Yeah, we can move to to speak about nature perspectives and the. the, the... And, and your initiative and how you think perhaps it addresses the paradigm level or, or changes the way we do conservation today or what do you think sure uh, so i think that's a good idea but can i um let me bounce a few things off you because i want to see if if we're aligned around this idea of paradigm change you know because i, I feel like i see paradigm change taking place uh often and regularly in our society in this uh, in this moment i mean even you know the idea that i showed you before about uh, unrestricted funding right that's kind of a a part of the paradigm change right mm -hmm. um you know i see things like you know um if you take for instance uber 
as an example, the idea of getting into a stranger's car and having them drive you around the city or to another place is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and then suddenly, just with one application, which does a good job of of um, of, of rating the, the drivers and that kind of thing, suddenly it becomes the norm. I mean, that's like that to me is just incredible, right? Like the amount of that, that's such a big change like that. Yeah. Airbnb is another example. And so I see technology um, and, and, and particularly the thing that technology is doing in those cases is, is like, is, is building networks, trust networks or something like that as being something that, that uh, is important to understand and to follow and to look at um, when thinking about how to change paradigms because imagine if you could do something like uber which changed everyone's thinking about conservation like that right yeah i i think it's a it's a great way to put it the, the way you said that it starts with something that sounds ridiculous it's completely out of right. the way we think of the world and all of a sudden it shifts and changes completely and and i agree that um, we can use technology to uh, shift paradigms. We see it over and over again in other sectors, not yet in conservation. This leveraging of technology. Well, yeah. um, exactly. It's happening. It's happening in all sectors. And and I guess you you're probably looking at some things, and now and you've seen changes happening in other sectors, and your your idea with nature perspectives is being informed by what you're seeing. And I'm doing the same, and and the work that I'm doing is also being being formed. So, let let's jump into these these projects and and see where we align. And uh, that would be great. how are we going to do paradigm shifting? Yeah, amazing. Um, I I think perhaps we'll we'll zoom out for a sec as an intro to that. Yeah. In the, in the past uh, two and a half years, uh, I've been uh, a part of uh, an initiative by Unorthodox, uh, which is called Digital Disruption for Conservation, Digital Disruption and the Future of Conservation. Um, and we really had a deep dive into uh, how is cons uh, conservation leveraging emerging technologies and how it is not leveraging conservation uh, technologies. Um, and if you take the framework of Donella Meadows, these leverage points, and you try to map all the, the, the conservation initiatives that employ technology, you would see that most of them fall on the lower leverage points. And, and I can give examples. AI is such a, yeah. such a profound technology, such a, a game-changing technology for so many things in our life. Um, in conservation, it's mostly utilized to automate uh, the detection of species and and to provide more information uh, uh, these algorithms which identify species from camera traps and so on so so that's by far the the largest use of ai in conservation that falls under information flows uh, we provide more data that doesn't use ai to uh, change our perception of nature Right. We don't leverage it at the paradigm level. And we see it across every te conservation technology that you can think of. But as we said, in other sector, you can think of social media as a technology that completely changed the way uh, people go about their day, people think about their lives and so on. So that really addressed the paradigm level of, of how we live. Can we do that? Yeah, I mean, just a, a really good example uh, gal is this conversation right uh you know two weeks ago we'd never met um uh, you know we we live thousands of miles away from each other and here we are now you know by the power of technology sitting across from each other having a really in-depth i mean it's incredible yeah yeah incredible and it's almost and it's it's we're so we're we're so blasé about it so yeah <laughs> sure it's, 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 normal. it's the new normal right if you would say it uh 20 years ago or, or even 15 years ago, it would be ridiculous. It would be completely out of the paradigms and the ways we think we see the world. Uh, so beautiful example. 
Uh, and I think that the, the main question is, can we do the same in conservation and how? How can we build technologies that fundamentally change the way we perceive the world, the way we perceive our relationships with nature, um, or how we do conservation, like, like in the case of, of your initiative? Um, and that's something that I found very exciting about, about nature perspective is that by, by, by design, we address the paradigm level of how we see non-humans around us. Uh, and, and something that uh, sometimes sounds ridiculous these days to, to people is that we would be able to converse with non-humans around us. We would be able to consider our, our house plants as having consciousness, life stories, memories, ancestral memories, and so on. Um, but we believe that, that uh, uh, that's the way forward to, to completely transform how we relate to the nature around us. So I'll, I'll just give it in, in one sentence. What we do in nature perspectives is we, see, we use AI, generative AI, to simulate diverse non-human perspectives around us, whether they be plants, animals, whole ecosystems, so that we can facilitate the conversation with these simulated personas or simulated perspectives. And what that does, it really, it really does change the way when, when you walk about this, the, your day on the street and you look at trees, you never attribute animism to them or, or attribute souls or attribute personas. Um, but through these simulations, it completely changes the way we, we, we perceive things around us. Uh, and I, I felt it personally the first when, when it came to my mind a, a year ago, I simulated my house plant, my Monstera plant back home. And I was doing it as a fun exercise to see what may I learn about it. And first of all, I, I've learned a lot, uh, even myself as a biologist who, who, who know a thing or two about plants. I found it as a great medium, a conversational medium with a simulated perspective is a fabulous medium to, to learn new things because my Monstera plant started uh, uh, sharing with me how did it feel like to be a Monstera plant back in the rainforests of Mexico. And, and what was a, a, a day in the life of a Monstera back then? And how does it feel when the sun comes through my living room window? Because it understands where, where it is positioned, the simulation. Um, and how it, it feels like to conduct photosynthesis. And aside from learning all these new facts, uh, and I'm saying facts because it's all based on scientific facts. It's, it's Monsteras really are uh, originated this species from the rainforests of Mexico. And whatever was incorporated in this storytelling technique uh, was based on scientific facts. So I learned a lot. But other than that, I started to look differently at plants around me. <laughs> I, I started okay. to imagine things uh, about their experiences and so on. Um, so so can, we, can we just dive in a little bit more about the experience that you're having talking like we're gonna start sounding like we're taking drugs at this time but uh so the experience you're having when you're you're talking to the ai that is is mimicking your the the plant is you're you're writing it like you're typing in questions and it's responding to you uh you, you can uh it's based on speech so you can actually uh so you can natural speak to language, it. Can natural it? language and, and to, to just ask whatever you want or, or, or uh, initiate the conversation in, in a very natural way because we want it to feel right. as well. Uh, and you get a response. And so you... you yeah. So, and so you, you ask the question to the plant, how does it feel to when the sun shines through the window? And, and, like, so, and how, does it, how did it respond? Well, uh, perhaps I can share it with you later, the, the, the actual uh, voice note that I got from the, this simulation. Um, but uh, it started to describe the, ce the cellular level processes that are going through its body, again, based on, on scientific facts. 
uh, in a yeah. language that I can understand and relate with. So it wouldn't say um, just like uh, we are just like humans, we feel this and that. It would never say that. It's not about anthropomorphizing. But it would give me right. metaphors in my language that I can relate with to better understand the photosynthetic uh, process. So I think at this point, perhaps I should elaborate on the science behind what we do and, and why we do it. Okay, sure. I think uh, another paradigm in conservation, something that we, we, we find most people in the conservation community would, would highly resist, is the notion of anthropomorphizing. And I prefer to call it animism. Uh, the, the distinction is anthropomorphizing is saying that something is, is human-like. It feels the same emotions and so on. Animism is attributing a, a lived experience to another animal or non-human. Um, and the origins of these paradigms is that the conservation sector, uh, as conservationists, we see ourselves as a science-based, fact-based uh, sector. But we should ask ourselves, uh, and, and you see this paradigm starting to change, we are more of a behavioral change sector. We have a clear agenda, unlike other scientific fields. Uh, we want to change the way people think of nature and, and behave in their day-to-day -day lives. And then you ask yourself, what is effective to create such change? And should we be that resistant to animism or anthropomorphizing and so on. And, and first of all, you see evidence uh, from the past of how uh, um, when we uh, attributed uh, lived experiences to non-humans, how it changed our perceptions. You, you see it all over. Um, and secondly, you understand that you, you cannot just throw facts on people without making them feel something about these facts. And the way you, you, you make people feel something is when you uh, make it make the story pack, packaged uh, in a language that they can understand and relate with. So what we do in, in uh, Nature Perspectives is we take these scientific facts and we uh, attribute animism to, to non-humans around us and that in itself, when you feel that you speak to a plant in a first person talking to back at you, um, that evokes emotions. And and that's that's where paradigms change. That's where the way we think of the world actually changes. Is is when we uh, either show our emotions as conservationists and talk about our love to nature and, and our fascination with nature, not our facts about nature. Uh, or when we attribute the, the, the same, um, uh, well, attributes to, to non-humans around us. Um, and, and you see from research, generally speaking now, as human beings, what we consider a thing that we should empathize with is whatever is within our circle of empathy. So we as human beings, again, generally speaking, we divide the world into in-groups and out-groups. It's true for groups of human beings as well whatever is more like me yeah, sure. whatever i can understand and relate with i empathize with how do we expand this circle of of empathy towards more human beings more human groups and also non-humans and one of the well the most effective methods for that again from behavioral uh, sciences is perspective taking when you put yourself in the shoes, in the mind of, of other beings, whether they be human beings or, or non-humans, then you find that empathy increases and you can understand and relate them better. So this act of perspective taking, that's, that's basically what we go for in Nature Perspective. And we enable people to imagine the perspectives of non-humans so that we can empathize with them better. Okay, cool. So there's a couple of things I wanted to to pull on there. Um, one, you mentioned about you know the NGO sector being science heavy. Uh, I very much agree. I mean, if you imagine if the private sector or the the 
private businesses decided, you know what, we're going to do everything scientifically. I mean, they would. You, you need to do and use the tools that are relevant for the problems you're trying to solve, exactly. right? And a lot of times in conservation, science is absolutely critical and important. But there are a lot of other problems that don't need science at all. Um, and, and we need to really wake up to that. Yeah. Or it's a different kind of science. It's a behavioral science. You know, it's 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 not the the right the facts of uh, biology, ecology, and so on. Right. Um, but the other thing I wanted to to dive in on the idea of animism. I love the way that you differentiate that from uh, anthropomorphization, and the idea of animism. Again, that's an ancient thing. Um, that comes from a time when we were living in harmony with nature. We would, we, you know, I spoke earlier about uh, Tyson Jung Comporta and, and the Aboriginal ideas of, of nature, at, and they see the system as a whole, right? And, and they don't see separation between the person and the system, right? It, the system and the person and the person are 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 all one. I mean, there's the there's the discussions. Uh, about like non-dualism and dualism and, uh, that go on around consciousness and things like that. But going back to to uh, and being able to bring back anim animism and to be able to do that perspective taking and to connect with nature, it's 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 not a radically new thing, right? And so I, I think that's that's why I think it's really powerful about the way you're thinking about it and in terms of its potential to shift paradigms right yeah definitely when you look back in history on where was this paradigm established why why do we not attribute uh, souls to to uh, non-humans you see that it's a paradigm which is uh, a couple of centuries old uh, mostly coming from from uh, uh, the enlightenment of sciences in in Europe and the western world right. and, and looking at uh, at nature uh, uh, or natural entities as, as machines and, and, and all these kind of frames. Uh, so fundamentally, what we try to do, this kin making, this uh, animism, this attribution of, of lived experiences to non-humans is, is not a new idea at all. What's new right. is the use of technology to reintroduce it into our uh, more westernized societies. So this is our entry point is let's make it uh, a fun experience that teaches you a lot and also changes your mm -hmm. paradigm of how you think of nature, uh, enables you to break out of this uh, centuries old paradigm, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that I think it's incredible. Thank you. I think it's incredible that we can be having this kind of discussion because of the technology that's around that can make something like that possible. Um, and it's it's very bold as well. And I, and I can see how you, you've got there because you're looking at the leverage and you're looking at, you know, the place we can have the biggest impact here. Um, I mean, it's not just a paradigm shift. It's, it's, I mean, it's close to like spiritual shift, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and arguably, uh, what's the difference, you know? It's the way we experience the world, whether it's spiritual, whether it's logical, whether it's, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We, we try to dig uh, deep. So that's incredible. Uh, so, so, you know, and, and it, where this overlaps with some of the work that I'm doing and some of the ideas I, I'm thinking about is in the, the power of story, right? And so in your, in your case, it's it's the, the power to be able to reconnect with uh, nature um, and, and natural entities through their ability to communicate with us and to make connection around stories of, you know, the plants, how the plant felt growing up in in uh, Mexico, for instance, and things like that. Um, the way that I'm looking at, at stories. I'm almost embarrassed to say it now because I think yours is such an elevated and um, uh, and beautiful project. Mine's a little bit, mine's more rudimentary and more sort of uh, market focused, um, but still my intent is 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 similar. Um, you know what I see is that 
you know, you know my experience. I'm an entrepreneur. I come from from uh, the private sector. I like to watch um, how systems are evolving and changing, right? And we talked about the virtue narrative and how there's profit organizations. How how can how can can an organization interact with its customers, get feedback on both sides, right? Mm. And so I, I look at at the I look at the nonprofit and the conservation space, and I say the the challenge with making the the conservation space only or, or bringing in profitable models, and also possibly part of the reason why there aren't more profit models out there is because specifically on conservation, it's hard to find a product, right? Yeah. That, that someone's going to buy um, without, you know, like, is it that you're buying trees that are planted and things like that, which, you know, that kind of thing has existed. And so I, I've, I've tried to reflect on, on, you know, are there new models that are taking place in the world that could help us to, to re evaluate our paradigm around what products and services are. And I look at things like, so for instance, a lot of, there's this, this, there's this movement or, or there's this trend towards um, traditional organizations becoming content first organizations, right? And so I'll give you a couple of examples about this. Um, you, have you heard of Wrexham, um, Wrexham United? Nothing. It's a football club in England, mm. right? So they were bought by uh, Ryan Reynolds, right? Yeah. He's this, he's a big, uh, you know, movie star and his mate. Uh, and the joke is no one can remember his mate's name, which I can't remember. At the <laughs> um, but uh, what they did with Wrexham, obviously they bought this football club. It was like a division four or five or a low division club. They did a documentary about it, right? Netflix documentary. They then turned the organization into a content first organization. So the, the, the organization's producing, uh, sorry, producing um, short form content, uh, podcasts, video, all of this kind of content to engage people, right? And so obviously the sales of their football games went up, right? The, the club started progressing. But they started to have this this big audience, and now when you look at the the um, the uh, annual report for Wrexham Football Club, the first things they're talking about is the number of subscribers in YouTube, the number of subscribers mm. in Instagram, the number of subscribers here, and the reason why is increasingly their revenue is coming from people who aren't even watching the football games, right? Those people are buying story. Yeah. You see what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, and this is being repeated over and over again. Um, Messi, uh, Messi recently did, did a really big deal. He got offered billions of dollars to go to Saudi Arabia. He didn't do it. He went to America instead. And um, a part of that is is about him owning the content that he's generating. And 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 there's this idea of like we're, what we're moving towards is we're becoming sellers of stories I love, it. Right? I love it and if i if i may uh, just, just a reflection yes. here uh w what's the name of the football team Wrexham, Wrexham. um Wrexham. football club um i'm wondering if that made them achieve better results on the football field uh, and well so with it, they have done because they they've started to get more money they're, you know, they put the, they bought better players then and they keep going up. Right. And that's part of the story that everyone's following. It's not like it's like you're supporting them. Right. Yeah. Like like you're a funder of the story of progression. I, I think there's a there's a great uh, analogy to learn from for conservation is that they completely changed the service, as you said, that they that they were not focused on on football anymore um and that by itself made them play better football because it gained more money more resources which they were putting into the right place so i think yeah it's a great analogy on how we can use stories or use different ways of thinking of what consists conservation exactly 
And so let me just, just keep going for a little bit. I'm going to share this. So this is a great organization. Have, have you heard of Mossad? Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, what they do is, is they tell really um, engaging stories about um, rewilding and actions that are taking place in, in nature. Yeah. Now, their model is that you, you can watch these, these videos and then you can become a member. Right, and you join, and they get a monthly subscription. I think the average amount is about ten US dollars per month that people people give. Mm. Now, the interesting thing is um, they have here. You can see four hundred ninety thousand subscribers. Yeah. They've got a hundred videos here. Right, amazing. If you compare their their um, success as a ratio of the number of videos to subscribers, these guys are the best by a mile in the uh, conservation nonprofit sector. You know, you look at something like uh, Sea Shepherd, mm -hmm. right? Sea Shepherd, what a brand, right? What yeah. amazing stories they could have. And they, they do really well on YouTube and they've got about 180,000 subscribers. So not even half what these guys have, right? Um, Greenpeace, all of the, the, the big uh, NGOs, they don't have anything compared to what these guys have. And these guys only uh, are a small team, started off with a couple of founders. They've got maybe, you know, uh, 10 uh, employees and they just go around making really engaging stories and storytelling and they've figured out YouTube, right? There's another one called Leave Curious based in the UK. And so I've, I've done an episode with him recently and, and I'm trying to figure out how I can work with him to, to help scale this storytelling. And so where my project is at is I think this whole sector needs to change to this. I think every NGO needs to ch turn around and start producing stories and start um, monetizing that. These guys, just to give you sort of an idea of, of the monetization uh, opportunity, I, I haven't got the numbers exactly right, but sort of, you know, uh, metaphorically, you'll get the idea of what I'm trying to say. 12 months ago, um, they had, uh, say, about, I think it was 2,000 subscribers, right? On a, and, and then in 12 months, their thing just went like that. And they're now at like 8,000 subscribers. They're generating over 2 million a year. Now, the thing that's really interesting with that is, they were like this for three, four, five, six years. And now in the last 12 months, they've just gone like that. And so next year, they're going to be at double what they're at again. Like this is an exponent. Mm -hmm. These are networks, mm -hmm. this power of network. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just go up and then flatten out. It keeps growing, right? Yeah. It's an exponential yeah. curve. And so they're actually their big problem, I believe, is going to be they're going to have too much money and and struggle to create enough stories here's but, something you, you didn't hear a lot in, in the conservation sector right exactly and and so i that's where i think the opportunity or it's at least the opportunity for from my perspective of how to change the paradigm is what if we look at the conservation as a storytelling mine right let's mine these stories bring them up share them this is what everyone wants to, to hear. We want to hear, you know, um, stories of, of the Death Star being destroyed, right? We want to hear that saving the world type stories. Um, but, but we've got to professionalize it. We've got to do it at scale. We've got to engage young people who know how to use these, um, these networks, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. We need to not be scared of these things. We need to double down and 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 buy into the idea of, you know what, if we can sell stories, we can do what we want to be doing even better. Something like that. I love it. And that's where I'm like, oh, shit, I can see we can monetize, productize, and and professionalize conservation like that. I, I, I so, love it, Anton. I think storytelling as a service. Uh, that, that's, yes. that's a brilliant idea. And it goes back to the search for what what value do we provide to the, the masses, you know? Because um, uh, right now, most conservation uh, organizations look at 
the public as donors rather than as uh, uh, as customers or as as uh, as themselves as uh, service providers. So that's that's right. that's a fundamental change in the paradigm. What what you suggested and and storytelling is such a powerful tool as well. And if we objectively look back at, at when in which occasions did conservation became main, mainstream and, and masses of people were, were interacting with it and, and consuming it. Uh, um, you would look at uh, David Attenborough and, and the BBC documentaries, exactly. uh, which, which I, I thought, okay, the, here's a, a, an interesting uh, data point, which I think w- when the Queen was alive, uh, David Attenborough was only second to, to the Queen in popularity in the UK. So you can see that the uh, arguably conservation figure becomes the most popular uh, character uh, a, a model for people in the UK, um, and that came through storytelling. And and you can see it all around you know, with Jane Goodall as well, and and uh, her going with National yep. Geographic and telling it uh, in a story manner. Uh, which, by the way, both of them did not shy away from animism or from attributing uh, uh, souls to animals and talking about emotions that nature evokes in us and so on. So they, they do not only package the, the facts for us, they, they bring the whole thing, the facts and the emotional uh, value. So yeah, so storytelling as a service is a brilliant idea as a model for conservation and definitely an avenue we should, we should explore. How do you guys go about it? Well, so I don't know. I, I've, I, you know, I've tried. I've tested some things with trying to build some, you know, like an Uber, uh, like a, a technology platform that could could empower that and at the same time, you know, uh, reward those kind of behaviors. I'm still testing those kind of things, um, but increasingly, I'm starting to think of like like you say the idea of of storytelling as a service like literally creating um a service-based organization that works with these uh with the the big miners in the industry so you know uh big ngos and helps them works with them to mine their stories monetizing it and then taking a share of that so something like that um is is more tangible and could get some quicker results both of the 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 options that you just uh suggested your platform or doing it as a service for existing ngos uh fundamental thing about these ideas that i like is that uh you're becoming an enabler you're not saying uh, and that's something that i've seen a lot in the conservation sector as well is how can I tell better stories for my organization versus how can I enable all organizations to tell better stories? So, and, and that goes back to the Uber analogy of they, they became enablers for people to become taxi drivers, right? Um, and, and those ideas that you suggest uh, would have far bigger scale uh, and potential for impact uh, when you do it at that uh, through that lens of, of enabling, I love it. Yeah, and, and I have a I have some thoughts or the beginning sort of thoughts about, you know, some of the there's this real reliance on on impact, measuring impact and and metrics, which I think is is important, right? But uh, and and some of the objections to to the idea of you know storytelling as a um, as a way to capture uh, impact are, yeah, but you know, I mean, that's, it's just all marketing, right? It's all just um, um, bullshit. You know, p- too many people can, can spin a story and that kind of thing. And my, I guess my response to that is when you look at the stories that, and the, the, the brands that, that scale storytelling on platforms like YouTube, um, it's, it's, there, it's authenticity, right? It's all it's authentic stories, and it's it's like people can tell yeah. that you can intuitively tell what is an authentic story and when what what when one's bullshit, and it's only the authentic stories that will will uh, scale. The other part of that is telling fiction 
fictional stories is really expensive. It actually costs a lot more to be inauthentic. Um, you know, like if you like our, our whole fictional uh, industry spends a lot of money creating those kind of stories. If you have authentic stories, it can actually be captured and retold quite cheaply. And so the market will reward uh, from both the supply and the demand side, authentic storytelling is my, my is belief. With impact making, with real impact, with real intentions, with real results. Um, exactly. Yeah, th there's much to, to, to unfold uh, in this conversation. What makes a story authentic? Uh, it, right. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I'll just share that in terms of um, storytelling and impact measuring, that's a very interesting uh, thing is that when you tell a story, you measure your impact usually either through questionnaires, right? Or, or some kind of change of perception um, or through the secondary indicators, which are the views and the subscribers and so on. So how do you know if you really change the minds of, of the viewers? And what I find fascinating in, in nature perspective is that it's a storytelling telling, uh, platform, but it's uh, bi-directional. So it's not a, a, a content that you put out there. It's a conversation which goes back and forth between you and the non-human uh, perspective. And through that, if you analyze conversations and interactions, you can actually measure change of perception through the ways people through the the way the convert the conversation evolves so there is something about conversation which you don't need the questionnaires afterwards you can actually uh right. yeah you can actually gather whether it was an effective conversation or not effective whether it evoked empathy or a change of perception or not through the content itself so that's something i'm excited about as well cool it's so exciting. Um, Gal, like I, I have to say this, I just really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. You and I are, uh, we're really in a very similar mind space. Um, I find that, that in itself really intriguing. Um, we've been going for a couple of hours now, so I, I think it'd be a good idea to start thinking about wrapping up. Um, but I think Again, there's probably some other topics that we could uh, we could keep uh, discussing and going on in a, in a part three potentially. Yeah, that would um, be brilliant. I, I is, is there anything else you'd you'd like to sort of uh, cover before we wrap up? Um, I, I think just let's keep the conversation going, Anton. I, I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed it a lot today, and and the other time we were chatting. Um, and there's so much we, we, we can talk about uh, in, in changing the ways we do conservation and doing it in innovative ways. So I really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward for the next time. Yeah. And, and if I could just add one, one last thing, you know, since I, I've been, I launched this podcast and I've been talking to, to and meeting new people like yourself, you know, part of my objective was to share you know, the optimism and pragmatic approaches that I've seen in the sector. But just having done this, I myself am getting more and more excited about and optimistic about where we're going, the people that are, are thinking about the problems that we need to solve. And, and, and I think this is one of those conversations that, that uh, just fills me with optimism and, and hope. So uh, that's a good thing. Thank you so much. No, I'm... I'm um the more I go down these rabbit holes, I, I feel more optimistic as well. And I feel that uh, we have things that we can do. We're empowered to do things and we can actually change uh, our relationships with nature and, and our future. So thank you for that. Excellent. Thanks, Gal. Talk to you again soon. Cheers.